before I throw out to the audience, um, I just want to start with Anthony Yu. How did the story come about? What was the genesis of this project? Oh, that's, that's such a difficult question. Um, I have no idea. I remember I was traveling a lot with Ilo Ilo for two years. I was literally traveling, doing a lot of promotions, going to festivals. And I basically ran out of in-flight entertainment to watch because I've seen everything on, on the flight. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, I don't actually actively go and look for ideas. Like, things would just come into my head. And I just wanted to make a film about a woman who is approaching 40 or, you know, in her early 40s and, you know, dealing with sort of a crisis, you know, in her marriage, in, in her family life, I at work. Um, it really started from there. I think I've always been very interested in female identity, female subjects, you know, you see that a little bit in my previous film, Ilo Ilo, with, you know, the exploration of motherhood and mother and the maid, and then I think this is sort of like a continuation of that. Yeah. And question for you, Andrew. What did you think when you first read this film? She's seen, she's just seen the film for the first time. Oh. Like, ever. <laughs> <coughs> Watching it, I, I don't know, lots went through my mind. Things that happened on set. But it got me a little emotional at that stage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first time I read the script, it was, I thought it's, you know, easy peasy. <laughs> Just a woman. And piece of cake, you know, seriously. But I didn't know I would meet so much obstacles when I was shooting it, when I was performing it. And, and there's a lot of uh, rethink and researching while I was performing this character. And there's a lot of uh, um, new, um, gosh, I'm getting a bit emotional again. <laughs> there's a lot of, rethink um, about performing as a performer, as an actor. What is it? What is it about, seriously? And I'm on my way of searching, actually. Um, after I finish the film, after I watch the end result, that's really, I need some time to take it in and, and to, um, to search more to how to go on with my creative path. And you guys have worked together a couple of times. Why do you keep working together <laughs> on projects? It's, it's very interesting. I didn't intend to cast her. <laughs> the reason being was um, I, I started from casting the boy. Um, like my previous film in Ilo Ilo, what I did was it was a very intensive sort of um, searching process for like I wanted a fresh face for this film. Um, we went to a lot of secondary schools. We saw hundreds of um, school children. 14, 15, 16 year olds, um, a lot of boys. You know, I was doing workshops over a whole year on weekends, and I just couldn't find the right person with the spark. And then one day I was sort of like looking on Instagram, and then I saw her face, and then I was telling my producer like, hey, this, this boy feels like, he looks good, like he looks good for the part. And I said, that's your actor from Ilo Ilo. <laughs> <laughs> because when I shot, him, he was like 11, and now when we're shooting, he was, it's, it's been six years, so he's 17, he just turned 18. Um, and then I couldn't recognize at him, uh, uh, I couldn't recognize him at all. So I said, okay, great, you know, let's bring him in. I, I phoned him up, we brought him in, he came into the same process with the other boys for a few months. And there was just like a spark, you know, he, he felt really natural. He just felt like this could be it, you know. And so we decided the casting from there, you know, we're gonna cast this boy. The problem is, if I was gonna cast this boy, I knew at the back of it, I'm not gonna cast her. Because in the last film, they played mother and son. <laughs> and I just felt like it's gonna be so awkward for me to watch. 
<laughs> so, so basically, it, she was like out of basically out of my head. Like it's it's not gonna happen. Um, we look at a lot of actresses, you know, like around that age group, you know, um, in the mid late thirties, early forties, you know, in Singapore and in Malaysia. There's not that huge amount of acting talent, you know, where we come from. And for me, authenticity and honesty is very important for, you know, like depending on where the film is set. So I don't feel like I could cast, you know, an actress from Hong Kong or Taiwan or China. So there was literally like, what, 10 I could choose from. And I met some of them, I tried some of them, and, and it didn't work out. And we brought Yan Yan in. Um, we <coughs> tested some scenes. Uh, but you could see like she's very short hair. All her life she's very very short hair. So it, it, it didn't really, you know, fit what I, you know, like the image of this teacher that I had. You know, there was a certain, there was a certain um, vulnerability. There's a certain fragility. You know, um, there's a certain um, 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 really gentle gentleness to this character. Um, and and when we decided that okay, we're gonna try and do this. Uh, we had to transform her entirely. So in the film, in the entire film, she's wearing on a wig. So it's not real hair. It's, it's hu real human hair, but it's a real, real human hair wig. But, you know, and, and we transform her through makeup as well. And I think it's, uh, I think why, when Yan Yan conveyed that it's such a difficult role later on, because I think it's a role that's very, very different from who she is or what she's played in the past before. Right. It's definitely different from who I am, but I definitely have the confidence to be able to play it as I'm an actor. Did I expand your imaginations and actors look? Did I? Clap. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I did. Seriously. <laughs> did I? Thank you. Thanks for the answer. We're we're all, you know, like I, I'm I'm seeing right in all of the performance. I think um, it's a very tough role for an actress. The reason being, you know, a lot of times when we schedule films, you know, like, you know, you have dates and then the actor comes in. You know, they do a day or two days and then they have a break and then, uh, or they oh I'm coming in for half a day because I've got like four scenes today or two scenes today. The problem with this film is, and it's very rare when, when there's a film like that, you know, she's in every single scene. And he cut out a few scenes. <laughs> so she's in every single scene of the film, um, and um, it just, it, it's a very tiring role. Like, we shot for 40 days, literally 12 hours a day, and like, it's like full on, like really, really full on. Um, yeah, so I, I think we realized, I think the entire crew also realized like, um, you know, while everyone was changing shift, all the males were like changing shift, right? The husband, the boy, the old man, they could come in and out, but, but, but you know, and, and it's emotionally quite, it's restrained, but it's very intense. There's a lot of undercurrents in this role. Um, yeah. Okay, I wanna throw out to the audience now. Um, if you could uh, stand up or raise your hand and speak loudly, there might be microphones that will run uh, down the aisles. Um, if you have any questions, yes, in front. Yeah, uh, the part of Sugar. I think the, the impression of Sugar was left by a certain aspect. And then, of course, that was followed by emotional effect and all other psychological effects. How did you get that aspect to basically be so effective? We got him into a hospital and nurse, a nursing home where there were a lot of stroke patients and he was, so he's, um, he's not a non-actor, he's actually a vet, he's a veteran um, theater actor in Singapore. I think it's the first time he has done screen work, he has always been on stage. Um, we put him in a nursing home for, um, to observe for like two weeks and he was observing a lot of stroke patients. Um, and then we did some special effects makeup as well, you know, like basically, um, you know, with stroke patients when you're half paralyzed on one side, you know, a side of your face would literally just collapse and we needed to do that. But I, did, I didn't I did want her, him to look like a creature. So it, it needs to be very subtle as well. So we had to do 
a little bit of latex work, we had to do a little bit of work on one side. Um, and, and of course, he had to know how to just do that with his mouth the whole time. Um, I think he's an amazing actor, a very well respected stage actor in Singapore. Um, in Singapore. Um, and I think he really brought this character to life. A lot of most people, um, <laughs> most people actually thought that we casted a real stroke patient. Um, yeah. We had a question down the row in the back. <laughs> yes, there was a back row in the back. Oh, right here. You have a question? Um, Is there a mic? about the film is that it felt like every moment was very specific and either revealed something or reminded us of something. Was this a film that was brought down a lot in the editing or was most of it there when you shot it? Like, was it, is this more or less how the script uh, functions? So I'll just quickly repeat the question. The question is about um, the film is very specific. Was there editing involved? Was, was the script brought down in the original? Um, I think it's very close to the script. It's, you know, I'm, I'm quite precise. Um, in the way I work, in terms of whether it's the lines or every beat that's on the script, every nuance that you see, it's there. Um, we have cut out a few scenes um, because when the whole thing was put together, we realized that um, there was a lot of stuff that was already said that we didn't need to repeat anymore. That um, it's it's quite interesting. You realize that in cinema so much emotion or so much could be said with so little and a lot of times I think a lot of films these days you know like it, it, it just needed to shout at you you know to convey every single you know thing but I realized that you know even even in this film you realize uh, um, you could see that a lot of shots out of the back of of of, of Yan Yan or of her but you just feel um, you just connect it and you know what's going on. Um, it didn't need to be in your face, it didn't need to be literal. Uh, and we have a question for you. So, the performance is remarkable. Um, and your preparation, I've read in the past, you really dedicate yourself to the role and focus on it. How was it preparing for this role? I had a very short time. I had about a month to do it. So it's not long enough for my hair to grow. <laughs> Seriously, <coughs> I love it to grow at the right time. Yeah, um, I think one of the most painful preparations is to inject myself. Oh, That's yeah, a physical, because, physical because pain. Because all that she did it herself, and it's, yeah, she learned how to use the, yeah, the syringes, the injection, the yeah. needles, and and everything that you see, it's not like a stand-in, it's not a dummy, it's not prosthetic, it's it's live injection. Yes. So I heard someone shriek at the first first time. <laughs> first moment. And I even heard someone thought I'm a druggie, you know, in the first <laughs> moment. So yeah, that's physical pain. Um, I think uh, mentally also uh, you know, I was I was not I was not embarrassed at all that I have to play a uh, lover with a, a someone who played my son. Um, I think it's the technical part that I was uh, concerned. Like, and I am also co I'm also concerned about his emotional, he how he is feeling. So um, from the beginning, I told him stop calling me mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so since he was eleven, he was calling me mommy. So the moment I saw him again, I said, stop it. It's time to stop. We are co-actors, come on. It's time to work, let's just work. And we actually spent a lot of time rehearsing that bitch scene. He was quite embarrassed. But I think uh, we both uh, came to agreement and this is what we have agreed to work in and we will be as professional as we can. Um, so, emotionally, I didn't expect Lynn to be so su so suppressed. S her, her emotions are so suppressed that I, I have to cry every night after I go home. I, I, I have to release 
I was crying every night. Uh, I was feeling very vulnerable. I, I couldn't I couldn't imagine what kind of life she's leading. My God, she's like a martyr. She's like goddess of mercy, my God. Like, I can't. I, I'm having goosebumps, you know, just thinking about that. Like, like all the stuff, all the things that she's containing in her little body. What is it? How can she do that? So that's just, that's one of the difficult part for me. Yeah. Any questions out there? Yes, and right in the middle here. Yeah, so the end of the film kind of suggests that both the husband and the wife character like ha are able to give birth. So what's the problem with, what's the reason behind like, uh, uh, what's the reason behind that they wouldn't be able to give a child like for eight years married? The question is about the story of life too. Yeah, because okay. both of them are, don't have the but, experience. But I don't know. Uh, do you do think the kid is the husband? Mm -hmm. Because I, I've never, I've never, when I was writing it, I didn't feel it that way, and I, I didn't want to be prescriptive about it. Um, I, I, I don't think it's his anyway. Um, I, and. To be very honest, like fertility is a very, um, you know, like I spoke uh, uh, to a lot of IVF doctors. Um, you know, I spoke to a lot of people that have been through it, and um, a lot of times you just don't know why. Um, you can't explain. You know, um, I remember when I was writing the scene where you know at the end, you know, and you know she did this random pregnancy test and then I remember on the script I wrote you know she couldn't believe what she saw like it's you know it's it's God you know playing a prank on her and I think that's what life is you know it's very hard to explain all that you know is it is it a spiritual thing is it a physical thing I mean, a lot of times, you know, doctors will say, oh, if you want to have a kid, you just need to relax. <laughs> um, it's, you, you just don't know why. Um, yeah, and it might be, you know, yeah, a divine intervention, a divine gift to her. Um, yeah. the rain. <laughs> um, I, th I think I've always wanted to use the element of weather in my films. I think I did it once in a short before. Um, and it's interesting, I grew up in Singapore. Um, we are a tropical country. We are on the equator. We, we don't have seasons. It's sunny all year round. Um, it's very hot. The only time when there's a huge weather change, it's during the monsoon season where it rains for four to six weeks. So it's it's really long periods of rain and it's really heavy rain. And somehow I just thought that felt like such an amazing um, element to use to paint the emotional landscape of Ling as a person, um, of what she's going through her journey. And at the same time, <coughs> You know, you could also look at it as, you know, a bit of how, you know, my own feelings towards Singapore, especially in the past 10 years. Um, you realize that it's always sort of like wet and cold in Singapore. The only time when we see the sun, it's in Malaysia. <laughs> it's not in Singapore. Despite the entire film, you know, did introduce you to some of the political sort of conflicts and troubles in Malaysia. You know, it's chaotic. Uh, there are a lot of problems there, even till today, even after the corrupt government has um, has been thrown out um, in, in the last election. Um, and yet, um, with all the chaos, with all the madness, um, yeah, the sun, the sun still shines. Um, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of small little details and thoughts. You know, um, you could you could read further into it. Um, I'm, I I don't like to be prescriptive. But I feel, if you look at, interestingly, like in the two feature films I've done, in Ilo Ilo and then in this one, there's, there's no score in the film that I don't use. Um, I use pieces of digestive music, but I don't use score. 
And for me, the score for the film is the rain. You really, I think it, it's, it paints the atmosphere for, for both the character and the journey. Can I tell you what I really like since I just watched it? <laughs> <laughs> so at the beginning when she starts driving and the rain comes in and she was driving in the rain, and it really, and, and she, the wind, sc wind sh screen just go, sh 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 and the, the water just came on coming. It's just, to me, like her, her life is starting to become murky. You know, it's starting to, it's kind of starting to melt down and murky, you know, you can't see clearly anymore. And that's how I feel at the first, when the first image hits me. after I watched the movie. <laughs> So this lady's conclusion is it's the husband's problem, it's not the wife's problem, but she felt guilty about it. I mean, that's, that's your interpretation of it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question on this line. I have no idea, but you know, I, you know, even though I grew up in, in cosmopolitan Singapore, we are very much uh, Westernized. Um, we, you know, like our first language really is English, but you know, I think there's a certain Chineseness, there's a certain Asianness that's sort of like in your DNA, and there's certain, you know, as as I was just speaking to like um, a Japanese friend and said, you know, as much as you know, you know, a lot of Asian societies, you know, women want to sort of like, you know, they want to be feminist, they want to, you know, be their own person. But there are, you know, a lot of times, it's not society that's pulling them back, but there's something about, you know, like them having to, to be good mothers, them having to be a good wife, you know, like there's certain things which, which, um, I'm not sure, like, but there's a, the, I think there's a certain thread of that, you know, like whether is it from a Chinese or Asian sort of like um, um, tradition or values that, that people hold on to, which is why, you know, I, I think when I was writing the script, I was very fearful of one thing. I was very fearful that Ling becomes a victim, but I don't think she's a victim. Because I think underneath all that, you know, like there is, it's a very dignified sort of steely character who still believes in hope. She still wants <coughs> to make it work, the marriage work. She still wants her students to do well, you know, like she's not just passive and being a victim, you know, like she's still fighting in her, in her own sort of little ways inside. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. You know, it, like why am I interested in writing about women and making films about women? I have no idea. I think we have to psychoanalyze it like in 10, 20 years time when all of a sudden you look back at your career, you look at it once and you go, ah, oh, perhaps, you know, like I, I have no idea. But it's just something that, there are two things that I feel like I was, I'm quite good at observing and sculpting women and children or, or teenagers, like somehow I'm, I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm quite sensitive at, at looking at that. Yeah. We have time for two more questions over here. Uh, what What inspired you to use the uh, durian in like two of the pivotal scenes? And uh, is there any deeper reason behind that? The question is about the durian in two of the pivotal scenes. You know the durian. If, if if you know it, if you if you if you know Southeast Asian culture is like it's such a it's like it's the king of fruits in in Singapore and Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Like um, 
it's one of my favorite foods. I love durian, like <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, it it has a very strong pungent smell, like. In Asia, you're not allowed to bring a durian into public transport. You're not allowed to bring it into hotels because it really smells like really stinky blue cheese times like 100. Um, that's what durian tastes. So, you know, when you when you when you talk about the forbidden fruit, I think this is the forbidden fruit in this film. And you know, if I was able to capture smell, you would be able to smell it now. But unfortunately. Um, Unfortunately, I can't. I try very hard to. If you look at the scene, there's this really um, intimate scene where it's just their eyes looking, and it's just not just between them, this cat and mouse thing, but it's between them and the durian. Um, and the thing is, if, if you're there, you could literally smell it. Like it will, it will just hit your nose right away. That's how pungent and strong that smell is. I mean, if I can't remember what's that. They're trying to, to do like five, 4D or 5D cinemas where we've got smell. You know, like if I could do that, you'd smell it. <laughs> Great, there's one more question over here. Um, I, I really love this film, A Year Low. A Singaporean makes me very happy to hear today spoken on the screen. <laughs> I think what's it? Oh, I think we better repeat the question. So the question is about uh, the language choices, uh, Chinese, different dialects, and Malay. So um, there's there's this other veneer to the film, this other layer to the film, and, and it's something which concerns me a lot, um, particularly in the past five to ten, five to ten years. Um, a lot of um, Chinese Singaporeans of um, that generation, Wei Lun's generation, you know, kids in primary school and secondary school, they are rejecting the language, they are rejecting the culture, they are not interested in speaking Chinese, they are not interested uh, in speaking Mandarin, they are not interested in really learning it, they are completely westernized, they grow up on um, American, on, you know, British TV and film and whatever, and, and because the working language in Singapore is English, it's so easy to just not have that mother tongue, you know, like even from an institution point of view, Chinese is not going to be the language that's going to get you into Harvard or Oxbridge. It's not, right? So it's, you know, there's a huge focus on math, <coughs> on science, on English and everything else. Um, and I'm seeing that and it's quite sad because for me, for me, for, for someone to exist, you need to have roots. And and I, I feel like there's a whole generation of um, young Singaporeans now that they're completely dislodging themselves from it, from their roots. But but they're not American. They're not British. They're like you know you need to hold on to something. And and, and that's something which why I painted the film in, in a certain way. I was trying to hold on to something. Um, and and the kids, you know, like all these kids um, that you see in the classroom, they came through my audition and workshop process, and uh, they're very much like that. And some of them are new migrants. When I say new migrants, it's their, their parents came from China and um, a couple of years ago, and then they moved and migrated to Singapore, and now um, their kids are completely rejecting um, Chinese altogether because they feel that is, you know, like, it's so odd, you know, like we, we try and move into a classless society everywhere else, but in Singapore, there is this quiet, unspoken thing where, oh, if you speak English well, you write English well, um, yeah, you seem to be um, of a higher tier. You, you get that sense you, um, very strongly, I guess. Um, and right now, we have, a, we have a new wave of migration. Singapore is a, it's a migrant country. Um, all our forefathers, whether you are um, 
India, no, you are Chinese, you know, they, were, they migrated from China, they migrated from India, they migrated from Arab, from different places. We, we are a bit like New York, you know, or America, like we are a completely migrant society, a very young country. But <coughs> there's a new wave of um, Chinese migration from China, a lot of people working and, um, and studying and, and they end up, um, you know, settled in Singapore. And the way a lot of Singaporeans sort of define themselves you know, the me against you is you can't speak English, you are not Singaporean. And it's so sad. Like right now, you know, you are you know, there's a certain discrimination, not even on sort of like you're the same race but but I'm of of a better pedigree or I'm I'm like properly Singaporean because I speak I speak English and I don't speak Chinese. And young people are starting to get proud of that. Um yeah, it's just something that I that's concerned me for um, for a while, um, and it's something that I I I sort of wrote into the film. Not not on this topic, but I just want to tell Anthony, thank you for taking a risk on me on two both of your films. Remember, Ilo Ilo took a risk because I was pregnant. He was going to reject me, kick me out of the film. I said, take a risk for me. I think I can do it. And this one, he didn't want to cast me. He didn't. He wasn't very sure about the previous mother and son able to do a little lover thing. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, really. It's both. <laughs> it's both really pushing me to a certain place especially this one, is pushing me to the cliff, to the edge of whether I'll continue to be an actor or not. <laughs> and I'm glad I took up the challenge. I'm glad I did not say I will give up in any moment of making the film. And today I saw the film, and I think, I think we've both grown. <laughs> Um, and I hope we both will continue to challenge ourselves and to make films. Maybe not with you for a while, <laughs> but let's grow together. Maybe when we grow old, let's make a film again. <laughs> the next time I cast her, she'll be like a 60-year-old in a wheelchair. <laughs> Thank you.